Hi, this is Amy from Good Food on Earth, and my guest today is Rosemary Frey. Hello, Rosemary. Hi, Amy. Nice to talk to you again. And Rosemary, I wonder, before we get started, um, I'd like you to give us a bit of information about your background, your familiarity with reading medical literature, scientific literature, and um, how you go about um, just briefly uh, investigating that or determining what is um, worth reading. Yes, so I have, um, I got a master's, I, I got a master's back in 1988 in molecular biology from the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary, and I immediately became a freelance writer, uh, and then other than about four years between then and 2016, I was a freelance medical writer and journalist, so I've read hundreds, probably possibly thousands of medical articles and I've, I've taught people how to write them. So I have, I'm, you kind of, it's not, it's sometimes not that hard to figure out what, what, what's valid, what papers are valid and what aren't, what papers aren't, because you can look at, first of all, look at the abstract, which is a short summary of the article that mo most journals or most places that publish articles require the, the authors of papers to, to write. And they, and you can see, is it in animals or is it in humans? the number of uh, number of humans or animals involved and what statistical tricks are they were they're using so there are some shortcuts you can take and of course look at the conflicts of interest section and that usually doesn't isn't the truth they usually leave, leave a lot out but if they do give you some clues then that can tell you uh whether uh and unfortunately the i'd say 95 plus uh, percent of articles are 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 lies Mm -hmm. I found that out. That's why I quit medical writing is because every time I picked up the phone, I'd have to figure out what the person I was talking to was, who I was interviewing, was lying to me about because all the studies are compromised because of the funding where the, follow the money. So um, unfortunately, it's, it's always the case of looking for where the lies are. Mm -hmm. And I know that actually, um, from looking at into medical journals, um, I think it was Marcia Engel of, um, she used to be head of the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and there was somebody else in the British Medical Journal as well, who mentioned this, that most of the articles are basically, they're compromised by whoever's funding them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really, really a tangle to get into. I have to, it's, it's um, when, when I started looking into them, um, because I uh, did um, studies in English language composition, and just reading them, I was like, oh my God, look at the, look at the way it's kind of twisted. And, and then later I came across an interview where somebody had done research into this and found that some uh, companies hire people to write like a pre manuscript for their article that they want published. And then the testers, the people involved in like the clinical trials or something kind of fill in the blanks. I've so done that. that. I've done ghostwriting where, yeah. where you write articles for the experts. That's it's good yeah. money. I've done it. I, I, <laughs> I didn't realize how bad it was. I don't know. So yes, it's very common. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't it, even I, fill in the blanks. The writers, the ghostwriters write the whole thing. Yeah, and then they pay for um, some expert with a good name to put their name as lead author yep. on the article. Yeah, yep. yeah, really fascinating. Um, so what the reason I invited uh, Rosemary on uh, as our guest is we're going to look at an article and this is dealing with the topic of the new variants. Um, this was published in uh, Children's Health Defense, The Defender, and there is some well, I want to say like as a starter, there's always good information in any sources you can find. You just have to figure out like how to be discerning and how to um, like if there's articles printed in the Defender, there may be some really important ones, but then there may be some stuff that you want to question. And that's always a thing. When I share news sources with you, I want you to question all of them and not just like take them on board as the gospel truth. So um, what I want to do is I'm gonna read this article through and then we're gonna examine it. And Rosemary is uh, gonna help us uh, take a look at this with a critical eye. So this was published on April 1st of this year and I'm gonna read it very neutrally. Um, Our species is enduring largest uncontrolled experiment ever. We shouldn't ignore Van den Bosch's warning. 
In his latest piece on the controversy stirred up by Geert van den Bosch, Alliance for Natural Health International's Rob Verkirk, PhD, says to ignore van den Bosch's warning would be foolhardy, inconsistent, and inconsistent with the known science. So that's your grabber headline, and then you've got your sub headline there, which is usually what most people will read. And I did a bit of journalism too, and that's kind of where most people stop. But then you wanna go and keep reading through. So you've got your editor's note here that says the defenders committed to providing a space for scientific debate. This is an opinion piece by Rob Verkirk, PhD, on concerns raised by Geert van den Bosch, PhD, about immune escape and mass vaccination during a pandemic. This article follows Verkirk's recent interview and previous analysis of the ongoing debate. And you'll see the hyperlink citations, and we'll go through those in, after we finish reading it. It was a week ago that we released my interview with Geert van den Bosch on our brand new Speaking Naturally channel. It's caused something of a stir in some circles, mainly among those of us who don't see vaccines as a panacea, or at least the sole exit strategy to exit lockdowns, social distancing, and other elements of the surrealism that have swept the world since the genome of a virus causing pneumonia-like symptoms in China was sequenced last January. The silence from those who are overseeing or administering the global mass vaccination program has been deafening. Some of the scientific concerns around Geert van den Bosch's arguments appear to be the result of linguistic interpretations. Others challenge Geert's speculative concerns linked to immune escape through the application of selection pressure from vaccines that could create ever more vaccine resistant and potentially dangerous virus variants. For the uninitiated, immune escape is a term used to describe when the host, in this case humans, is no longer able to recognize and counter, eliminate or sterilize a pathogen, in this case, a relevant variant or mutant of SARS-CoV-2. Selection pressure, on the other hand, is a term used to describe the process, gene-environment interactions, that helps an organism or pathogen to evolve in ways that make it better adapted, i.e. more able to survive and propagate to its changing environment. Antibiotic, antimicrobial resistance is a good example of selection pressure caused by overuse of antibiotic drugs, which has selected for more and more bacterial strains that can detoxify or tolerate commonly used antibiotic drugs. Let's be reasonable, not polarized. I'm not an immunologist, virologist, or an epidemiologist, but I do have three science degrees in ecology with a PhD and a postdoctoral research, Imperial College London, in the area of multitrophic interactions in agroecosystems. I've therefore been long fascinated by interactions between host, herbivores, carnivores, and pathogens. I've also been looking closely at the science around COVID-19 since the outset and have been a critic of health authority and government handling of it from the outset. I'm writing this update on the Vandenbosch controversy because I'm concerned it has the potential to unnecessarily divide people who share many common views and values while differing in others. Alongside generating mutant variants of SARS-CoV-2, one of the haunting consequences of lockdowns has been their ability to polarize communities. I believe passionately that we need to be more tolerant of those with whom we share significant areas of our respective COVID-19 Venn diagrams. Don't expect that you'll find unanimous agreement with many people given the amount of scientific uncertainty that abounds on so many of the scientific, medical, social, political, and economic issues surrounding COVID-19 and the way it's been and is being handled. We must have forums to be able to discuss scientific matters, and we must be ever careful to not destroy the reputation of individuals who potentially can be important catalysts for change. The host pathogen Tango. The reality is that, as ever, 
the relationship between a pathogen and its host is not a simple one. It is not only highly complex, it is also dynamic. It's a tango that involves both players who don't like dancing to the same music. While lockdowns might increase the time it takes to achieve herd immunity, the mainstream scientific view accepted by governments with little evidential basis has been that lockdowns will also reduce opportunities for transmission chains being established. Lockdowns, curfews, social isolation, and the like were meant to be temporary stand-ins until vaccines were ready. There are two fundamental problems with this approach. First, people don't stop transmitting viruses among each other, even in lockdowns, and more opportunities for mutation are created, including among the most vulnerable people that allow for the greatest level of viral replication. This explains the generation of at least 16 mutant lineages in South Africa. Secondly, now that the vaccines have come, they don't stop transmission of all SARS-CoV-2 strains, especially those that are resistant to antigen-specific antibodies that they are designed to induce. More than that, if you apply a very strong selection pressure because you have a highly infectious virus that has lots of opportunities to express its inborn error code mutations, or you vaccinate millions or even billions of people with a highly specific antigen constructed around the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, you are inducing massive selection pressure like never before in human history. That is one of Geert van den Bosch's concerns, one he has a right to have and express. We also know, for example, and there's a cited article, that the UK variant B117 that originated in the UK and B1351 from South Africa have extensive mutations in the main receptor binding domain region of the spike protein that binds to the ACE2 receptors in human tissues. Not only that, neutralizing antibodies that have been created in response to exposure to wild virus or the vaccines developed to match the original Wuhan strain don't neutralize the virus effectively. Van den Bosch's red flags. The story continues to evolve and unfold because the relationship between the virus and its host does as well. What we're now beginning to see is the same mutations in the spike protein cropping up in different parts of the world. For example, the UK variant B117, the Brazilian variant P1, B1128, and the South African variant B1351. All share common mutations such as E484K and N5011Y. That's and a typo, by the way. It's N501Y. Sweet. He does. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and these were these were Gert's red flags. It suggests that different various virus strains have found the same way of outsmarting the highly specific vaccine. And in the process, these new virus strains are becoming more transmissible, including among younger people. That creates ever greater opportunities for mutation. The show goes on and potentially never stops, especially if you keep interspersing your strategy with lockdowns and related measures. But don't trust me on this. I'm just an ecologist. Some of the most thorough work in this area is being conducted by Paul Bianaja's group at Rockefeller University, the same university which Nutwikowski, see our separate interview, was associated for many years. The group has shown clearly that new mutant variants such as E484K and Q493R are resistant to antibodies produced by the original Wuhan strain on which the existing clutch of vaccines are based. Okay, so Bionage's group has gone down the road of developing engineered monoclonal antibodies as a solution to get around the problem of immune escape, both from wild infection or antigen-specific vaccines. In fact, they're moving forward with trials for commercialization of monoclonal antibody therapies that could be delivered as injection. And then he shares this video, which is interesting that people can watch. And so he asks, what 
our species is currently enduring is the largest uncontrolled experiment ever conducted. Not only are highly specific vaccines being applied in a manner that is considerably different from any previous vaccines, the frontrunner Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are also most definitely experimental. Phase three trials results are incomplete and they rely on lipid encapsulation delivery systems that have never been used at any significant scale to get synthetic codes into our muscle cells. We also have no good idea of how effectively our T cells will be corralled into our armory of immune defense or how vaccine induced immunity compares with naturally acquired immunity. Let's not forget the SARS and MERS epidemics never had the same opportunity for mutation. Geert van den Bosch has rung an alarm bell that many it seems don't want to hear. To ignore the wider concern he expresses around the selection pressure that will create immune escape and antibody resistant strains would be foolhardy and would be inconsistent with the known science. So that's the article. And there's actually some interesting things here where he contradicts himself in like he tries to differentiate immune escape uh, with selection pressure and then uses immune escape as something that he's saying is what's going on when he wants to say it's selection pressure. But I'm not going to go into all of that because <laughs> that would take forever. What we're going to do, um, if you're up for this, Rosemary, is I want to talk about first, um, what do you take away from this article? What's, what's the aim of this article that was written? I think the aim is to make people believe that what Hetfan and Bosch is saying is true and that it's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's propaganda. And, mm -hmm. and it, it is interesting because he does talk about how there are disagreements in the community. Um, but what he does state, I think it was at the bottom, um, there was a part where, don't know if I, there was a part where he was basically saying that like the science is clear and it, yeah, it would be inconsistent with the known science right. to ignore his warning. Right. So that's, that's an interesting thing because we've heard that I've seen that quote for people who bring up concerns about vaccines in general and for other things where there's a paradigm in science and you say, well, it's inconsistent with the known science, therefore, it would be dangerous to express some alternative uh, considerations. Mm -hmm. So the, the aim of this article is quite interesting, but I think it is to bring people around who are skeptical and to say, well, this is actually what the science says, so you do have to agree with it. If you don't, then you're almost like anti-science. Um, and I wanna ask, when you write an article, Rosemary, what's the point of citations? these hyperlink citations, what, what would you use hyperlink citations for? What do you mean, to contrast it with what he's doing? Um, well, for yourself first, when you include hyperlink citations in your articles, what would you use them for? Just to show people that I'm, I want to link to the primary source so people can see for themselves where I'm getting my assertions, because um, otherwise, we, when I read an article, I want to know where people get their information so I can check whether their source, whether there is source material saying what they what they say, because people otherwise can say all sorts of things. They can say, well, this person says this or this is true. And if you can't check it, then it's impossible to know whether it's true without doing a lot more digging yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. You said it's primary source documents. What do you consider those to be? Um, that's a great question, Amy. It needs to be an original study. I mean, you go as deep as you can. So if it's just a newspaper article, that's okay, but it's far better to have a video or a, or a, pers a published paper by that person, something where the original information being, uh, being put forth or asserted is there rather than somebody's interpretation of an interpretation or somebody saying something that somebody said about somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I, what I found interesting. I clicked on uh, the hyperlinks here in this interview and or this article and when it gets down to the parts where he's trying to cite um like he has a hyperlink here for SARS-CoV-2 and here I want to start with this one 
in this first paragraph, he has a hyperlink for virus. And he's talking about, you know, the genome of a virus causing pneumonia-like symptoms in China. So I click on this, but what it takes me to is the Defender's um, wow. homepage on COVID. Mm. So that doesn't really tell me anything about the virus. And I would have to try to dig through these articles and see if there was any that contained source documents, if that's the route I wanted to go. But that would be, that would take a lot of time. That's a, and, red, that's a red flag for sure. He should be linking to a paper that shows the, the, the sequence. Yeah, and then next one is where he does hi hyperlink SARS-CoV-2. So I click on that one and that goes to Children's Health Defense and October 21 uh, letter to Congress urging COVID-19 origins investigation. Mm. So again, that's like, well, that's not a primary source document on SARS-CoV-2, and I have to do more digging. That's going to take a lot of time um, and effort on my part. He doesn't provide any hyperlinks or information for um, immune escape that he talks about here. Like, where's the scientific uh, stuff? You know, that would be something I'd be interested in. So he, he says, you know, for the uninitiated, you'd kind of want to see like, well, what does he mean by immune escape? Can he, can he give any like links to that so I can see the data on it and not just, you know, this is what we think is happening and selection pressure as well. Um, one interesting thing in this art on this paragraph where he talks about antibiotic resistance, you'll notice that word there uh, in parentheses, antimicrobial. So uh, I want to ask you, Rosemary, um, what's the difference to you when you see antibiotic? What does that mean? Antibiotic. Uh, now, uh, antibiotic means it's a type of medication used speci specifically against bacteria, whereas antimicrobial is much more broad. I mean, he's maybe using that to insinuate to suggest that that um, antibiotic resistance extends to resistance to um, resistance on the part of other microbes, whether it's viruses or, or phages. Yeah, and microbes, there's like a whole bunch of different <laughs> microbes. Out, so it's, it is very broad. What I found interesting is I was doing some recent research and found that um, antimicrobial resistance is a, like a, a big new push from the World Health Organization. And I'll show the, the document later mm. um, when we go through this. But that was quite interesting to see that he put that in parentheses after antibiotic resistance. Um, so yeah. yeah, yeah. And so let's go down to the other parts where he talks about, he talks about this host pathogen, and then he starts to cite here, he's got the 16 mutant lineages in South Africa. So this is what we come up with. And this is on PubMed. So I wonder if, um, if you want to have a look at this, Rosemary, and see, like, how can people go, like, take a look at this and decide, you know, is it worth reading? Like, what parts, how can they take this apart and understand it? This is cool. Sure. Well, first scroll down a bit to the abstract, mm -hmm. because we can't tell anything yet just by reading the names unless you know everybody's name. <laughs> you have to, uh, okay, so we full lockdown, fine. Um, lineages, lineages, okay. I just have to quickly read it to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh. Well, then look at his last sentence. Our findings show that genomic surveillance can be implemented on a large scale in Africa, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't know anything yet from the mm -hmm. um, abstract. It just clearly seems they have a particular aim. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want genomic surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you and I know, and uh, I think many of your viewers would know that we don't want genet genomic surveillance. We don't want people taking our blood and, mm -hmm. uh, and taking, and, or, and, or other ways of testing us. Yeah, and what is interesting is um, if people haven't been looking into this, there is a whole goal for universal healthcare and universal healthcare coverage that needs, that is supposedly based on personalized, so like based on your genetic code, your um, uh, microbiome, which they consider like your unique genetic fingerprint, um, that has to be personalized and predictive. So there's a new term that I saw um, recently, 
um, before preventive, they've added a new category called promotive. So there's promotive, preventive, uh, therapeutic, and that type of medicine. So it's interesting to see like genomic surveillance. And, and what I noticed when I read, um, when I read through articles is that sometimes in the abstract, um, when you read through the rest of the study, if you have access to it, it doesn't actually support the conclusion statement in the abstract, like their findings don't quite support it. So that's the tricky part is like, you know, they're giving you a lot of kind of information there. And what I would do is if they have anything cited and if I had access to the article, I'd look at the studies they're citing as well to try to get to the groundwork and see is, are they really telling me the fact from that study or are they telling me, you know, what they took away from that study? Are they making stuff up? Yeah. 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 It's really interesting. So that's the one about uh, the 16 mutant lineages in South Africa. Um, and I know um, I'll cite again for people who aren't familiar with your article that you published in February on the new variants. Did you get a chance to look at um, the ones from South Africa at all? I haven't gone. I, I looked at in my that article, I described the basic uh, changes that are also, I think, uh, uh, present in. Yeah, I looked at one of them anyway. The N five hundred one Y. I'm not. No, I haven't. Uh, I kind of. No, it's endless looking at the new. And if I if and when I do another piece, I'll certainly look at it. And of course, I keep a little bit of prize, but I haven't not. Well, and what's interesting, I want to ask you about that is because you did um, like the basic on the new variants and you looked at like the three major studies that they were using as supporting evidence. So what or I want to supporting evidence to say that they're more transmissible. There's one particular yeah. mutation they say that a change really in the gene sequence that they say makes them much more transmissible. I looked at those papers for that and said, wait, they don't say that. Right. So, so what's interesting is um, if you're somebody who's new to research, if you can go to that basic material, like what Rosemary did, then once you understand that a new story like this with 16 mutant lineages out of South Africa, you're not really going to waste your time investigating every single one that they're going to come up with because you understand the basics behind it. Um, so when I interviewed you before about the new variants, we talked about like how um, how dangerous are new variants typically? And I wonder if you could address that again, just for, for here, because I think that is underlying this. If you don't have, um, a basic understanding of these, like what happens with changes in nature and things existing, like how dangerous are these little changes? It's very insignificant. The number of changes are, are there's thousands probably every day across the across all of the viruses. You know, if you take say the novel coronavirus, which you and I agree doesn't really exist, but or there isn't evidence that it exists, not strong evidence that it exists. Viruses, there's tons and tons of mutations for any particular virus or any particular type of bacteria. I mean, they don't change the function. It's just uh, because so many of them don't change the function. In this case, though, they want us to believe that every single change may well be significant and could signify the end of the human race unless we act quickly in, in some way. And what's interesting to me is that to believe that, to buy into that, you have to think you would have to imagine that these viruses are existing in isolation from everything else in the environment, that you yourself are not part of a dynamic environment that, you know, like if, if you also have to take into account the um, studies on like the microbiome, and if you agree with those studies, that premise that you have um, all these microorganisms as part of you, what's happening to those all the time, every day? Like, are they, are they not involved in changes? Those interactions that happen, like when we're looking at it, looking at viruses in a different perspective, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fanciful. And, yeah. and, uh, and they call it, they, they don't go as far as to say they're new strains. Some, some papers or some articles say, oh, it's a new strain every time there's some mm -hmm. a different a change, but that's a strain has to be something that's really, really different. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they tell us that's what happens with the flu every year. And that's why we need new vaccines. But that again is probably largely fictitious, fictitious as well. It's just yeah. <laughs> follow the I, money. This is, you know, it's great to be able to sell more vaccines. It's very, very profitable. 
Mm -hmm. And not just vaccines. And I think that's what we'll find like with this article, there's some other treatments as well, because it's a big money making thing. So we've got like the vaccines that are one key part of it, but there's also the other proposals for treatments. Um, so what I found here is another one, uh, very strong selection pressure. And this one was interesting. So let me read this sentence again. He says, more than that, if you apply a very strong selection pressure, because you have a highly infectious virus that has lots of opportunities to express its inborn error code or mutations, or you vaccinate millions or even billions of people with a highly specific antigen constructed around the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, you're inducing massive selection pressure like never before in human history. That's a very long sentence. But um, what's interesting about that too is like we, we just mentioned the SARS-CoV-2 the spike protein that somehow these vaccines are developed around this identified spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. Now, where's the evidence for that? I'd like to see it. Because oh, sorry, evidence for what? Of uh, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, you would have to show the SARS-CoV-2, right? You'd have to show the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, proof of isolation of that this novel virus exists, what it's composed of that, you know, and what's interesting is and what they I have it in hand. They use, it's like exactly. a technology, it's circular. They use antibodies yeah. to show that it exists mm -hmm. and, and yeah. And those antibodies in fact are not specific to anything. Yeah. 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 And so that's interesting in and of itself in that sentence, but here's the study he quotes. Um, this here, it's from 1998, Chaos, Persistence, and Evolution of Strain Structure in Antigenically Diverse Infectious Agents. Now look at the second author on this paper here. Oh my gosh. You see. Yeah. Neil Ferguson. Our buddy. So big, big, uh, you know, questions there. Um, and I'm going to look into uh, Robert Verkirk, the author of the article, because he did mention that he did a postdoctoral at Imperial College London. So if people don't know the connection there, but that's where Neil Ferguson is, they receive funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There's, they've been involved in some other scares that shouldn't have happened before in the past. I wrote um, about him and another, he's one of the modeling paper mafiosi where they are expressly, their purpose is to scare people by creating these mathematical models that are purely theoretical that, that say whichever virus or whichever pathogen or whichever condition is going to just wipe out uh, millions and millions of people or animals. Mm, yeah. Or it's yeah. the government's agenda and, and the fear campaign on all of us. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And to see that this was quoted um, was kind of like, I mean, you know, it, it's to me, I, I feel like I want to laugh because it's like, you know, if anybody were to click on that and they were to see Neil Ferguson and they did any basic background history into this, they'd be like, hmm, I don't know if that's really a supporting document you want to include. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about the title of this. What does this mean to you? This chaos, persistence, and evolution of strain structure in antigenically diverse infectious agents. So you mentioned before what a strain, like a strain is something um, different than just like a, one mutation. There's a difference there. And I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that and the antigenically diverse infectious agents. What does that mean? Well, strain structure is, yes, when there's mutations occur in the genetics and genetic sequence, and that then translates potentially into some um, changes in this, the protein sequence that's formed based on the, on the genetic sequence. But often um, those mutations do not tra translate into any changes. But if there are a lot of changes in the protein structure that can potentially form a new strain, which means there's actually a new form and or function of the particular infectious agent that's being looked at. And antigenically diverse means that uh, it means, I'm not sure what it means. I've never seen that phrase before. Maybe they made it up for this title. It just means that the, the antigen is, it's any particular thing can be an antigen. It's, a, it's something that presents itself to the environment. And antigenically diverse means there's a lot of different things on that thing that's presenting itself to the environment. Yeah, yeah. And here's, let's see, their abstract says the effects of selection by host immune responses on transmission dynamics was analyzed in a broad class of antigenically diverse pathogens. 
strong selection can cause pathogen populations to stably segregate into discrete strains with non-overlapping antigenic repertoires. However, over a wide range of intermediate levels of selection, strain structure is unstable, varying in a manner that is either cyclical or chaotic. Ooh, These chaotic. Results, yeah, these results have implications for the interpretation of longitudinal epidemiological data on strain or serotype abundance, design of surveillance strategies, and the assessment of multivalent vaccine trials. When was this published? It looks like it was published in 1998. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting, there's another familiar name there, Sunetra Gupta. Gupta, I haven't, um, I didn't look or look this person up again, but I remember that name. So if anybody's interested, like go ahead and look it up. But I do notice from the email zoology. Now, if people remember from last year, there's still this narrative going on and it's still quite widely accepted in certain circles that these viral strains are coming from animals to humans and either it's being caused by our our effect on the climate is the story Our the way that we get our food, the animal farming and that that's the story. But this is a big thing. Um, you can look up quanta magazine and there's a whole idea that the way that we live, we're creating these, um, super bugs, these antibiotic resistant bacteria. And now we've got the anti vax or the vaccine resistant, uh, viruses. And this is a story that has been coming in. It's another part of the, uh, the angle there. So that's interesting to see. Um, let's see now. So here's another, when we go down to this paragraph um, where he cite, there's two hyperlinks here. And this is funny because if you just read this and you don't click on the hyperlinks, you would think that there's two supporting documents for what he's saying here but it's actually the same document, just hyperlinked twice. I do that occasionally though, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah it, if I'm citing a similar thing, but it's not always appropriate, but this doesn't seem appropriate because they also, the first sentence says, we know this, mm -hmm. ah, not only that, we know this. And the, if they have the same thing, unless there's a really good reason to cite the same thing, if it's a really strong paper that mm -hmm. shows most things, that's okay, but otherwise not. Yeah, but and you're right, because he says in that next sentence there, not only that, but then we know this as well. And this is the site to the to the same document. So it's it's kind of interesting because your impact, if you're just a reader, you would think, oh, there's a lot of strong support for mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And you won't check it out. But because you see these hyperlinks, you think, oh, this is a well cited article. And this paragraph here has got like, you know, strong support behind it. So that's interesting. And that article links up to this guy here. This Those article are, is a preprint. Sorry, that's the links that you're talking about? Yep. Yeah, the link is uh, the two links cite up to this article. And this is a preprint. That means it's not been peer reviewed. Um, and I think you might, I don't know, did you look at one of these? Because this is about the variants B1351 and B117. I might have, but I don't think so. I might have looked at it. it it's pretty easy to dismiss these, or well, I shouldn't say it. I don't go out to dismiss them, but I, it, it's, it's not likely to be very credible. I never heard of this journal, RESQ, SQ, is that Research Square or something? Let's, let's Name see. Of the journal. I haven't clicked on it, but we'll have a Research look and Square. see. That is weird. Yeah. Uh, Let's who publishes it? And... We'll have a look there now and see. Um, what the... hmm. I think I'll just have to search on uh, on the search engine after and have a look. But yeah, I, I am not familiar with that either. Um, and what's interesting is that it's not peer reviewed, which to me would be the first thing. Like, okay, this is just um, an initial kind of paper, but there's not much feedback on it yet. Right. And they, they say in their abstract, um, let's see, this is about, looks like it's about monoclonal antibodies, therapeutics. So mm -hmm. now we're getting into the um, solution that's being proposed in this article too. Um, let's see, developments, prospects of ending this pandemic uh, rest on the development of effective interventions, 
Two monoclonal antibody therapeutics have received emergency use authorization and more are in the pipeline. Furthermore, multiple vaccine constructs have shown promise, including two with around 95% protective efficacy against COVID-19. However, these interventions were directed toward the initial SARS-CoV-2 that emerged in 2019. Considerable viral evolution has occurred since, including variants with a D614G mutation that have become dominant. Viruses with this mutation alone do not appear to be antigenically distinct, however. Recent emergence of new SARS-CoV-2 variants B117 in the UK and B1351 in South Africa is of concern because of their purported ease of transmission and extensive mutations in the spike protein. We now report that B117 is refractory to neutralization by most monoclonal antibodies to the N-terminal domain of spike and relatively resistant to a number of monoclonal antibodies to the receptor binding domain. Okay, and I find this is where a lot of people would be like, I don't understand what these people are mm -hmm. talking about. And they're just going to be like, well, they must know what they're talking about. So I'm going to leave it to the experts. <laughs> so I wonder if you could take some of that apart and like simplify that. And, and before you do, I want to like, what I would get from that reading that first part is when they state that um, there's two things that pop out at me. One is the monoclonal antibody therapeutics because I looked into that and I have some like background on how they're big um, emerging money makers for the big pharma. But the other one is um, they talk about how these vaccines- I, I wrote about that, how they're very lucrative. I wrote that antibody deception article about it. That's right, yeah. So we'll have a link to that article as well for people to look into as a starting point. And, um, and that's like, I, I always say to like, if you really want to investigate, all these things are starting points and then you got to look for, look for yourself a bit if, it, if it's something that matters to you. Um, so the other part is they talk about the vaccines with around 95% protective effect efficacy against COVID-19. And that's something that I already have background on where I know that that's not the picture that people assume it is, that 95% efficacy is uh, effective at what is the question, right? Because you could say, yes, it's, it's effective, but what are they talking about? And how did they get those numbers? What was the clinical trial structured as? How many people were involved? Was there any like um, questions around that con uh, final presentation? And, and I, so what do, you, what do you take away from this article and what could, you, what could people who don't do this research normally um, take away from something like this? Which one do you want me, which part do you want me to look at? Um, which whatever sticks out to you as, you know, somebody who reads these often, more often than uh, me. Well, it says, well, no, but anybody can look at it because you say that sentence in the middle, maybe you could point your, your, yeah, uh, sure. Highlight. Recent, recent emergence of news, it's that one. It's okay. That because they're purported ease of transmission and extensive mutations in the spike protein. Purported, it means like supposed. So it's a bit mm -hmm. uh, qualifying it, but that we know I've certainly looked into it and there is not such great ease of transmission and extension mutations. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, anyway, it's report. Yeah. And the, yeah. It's yeah, you're right. Getting, the, sorry, I'm getting a little tired. So I want to speed this up a bit, but that's okay. Um, so when they say it's refractory neutralization, we'll show us. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure if we looked into it, it's actually, that's probably just basing it on theoretical models and not actually showing. Yeah. It's just yeah. too theoretical and not true. Well, what I'm going to do, since I know we're, we're a bit, um, we're, it's, this is a while. So I want to talk about the experts that he's cited um, for in the, in the article. And this guy, Paul Bionage, or I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, at the Rockefeller University. So if you were to see that name, what would be your first steps to figuring out, you know, what this guy is about and if he's like an expert that's worth looking at? I'd look at his bio, see where his funding comes from. I'd look up papers that he's written and see who funds those or what they've found and where the errors and biases are in those papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, I'd look up what else he's quoted as saying and, mm. and who he works with. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to see what his um, history is and what he's been involved in working on, 
Because that's usually like, even if he doesn't have a conflict of interest, he might have some biases that you want to consider. So what I found interesting here at the bottom, you'll see Bianaj is a faculty member in the David Rockefeller graduate program. And that to me is kind of like, okay, well, so he's going to Rockefeller University. That's not um, in and of itself anything, but he's also a faculty member of the David Rockefeller graduate program. And that together kind of raises more questions. And then the type of research he's doing and what he's involved in. Um, The guy who they have a video that shared on the article we've been examining. And this is the guy who's interviewing him. This is the president of Rockefeller University, Mm. Richard P. Lifton. He looks like such a nice guy. Yeah. (laughs) And and I would look into him too, (laughs) because you know, um, see what he's involved in. And it's interesting as well, his, his, they're in genome analysis, you're looking at people who are into the genetic part of things. And you can see in, in addition to his university responsibilities, he serves on the advisory board of several nonprofits, such as the Whitehead Institute, the Broad Institute, and the Simons Foundation, which I shared some information with you, Rosemary, but um, not many people know about them. You might want to look into them because they are uh, involved in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And if you don't know that, you should look it up. Um, he's also a board member of- Do you know about Cold Spring Harbor? Is it compromised too? I haven't looked at it in decades. It, it was the eugenics laboratory that was started when eugenics uh, came to the States. So that was its- base. But you also get people like uh, Barbara McClintock. There's excellent, excellent scientists who have worked there. So I'm not sure I'd have to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's like the interesting thing is like that in and of itself is not a major red flag, but it's all these pieces put together. Mm -hmm. If you get a lot of them put together, then I'd be like more questions to look at. Um, It says he's also a member of the board of directors of Gen and tech or Genentech. Yeah. Yeah. And Roche. Roche. Right. Yeah. That's a clue. Yeah. So I'll tie this up because there's more that you can dig into with this article. Um, But basically, you know, that's kind of like I would look at what the aim of the article is um, and what the citations do they qualify as satisfactory supporting documentation and are there any considerable conflicts of interest? And um, and like I was just saying, all each one of these points by themselves are not like an issue. They raise questions, but when you put them together, that's when it's like, well, do I really wanna take this um, article at face value? Or does this basically have more questions than than I'm comfortable with, you know? So Robert Verkirk, he is the author. Um, They say he's an internationally acclaimed multidisciplinary sustainability scientist. Now that's a key word. Uh, to take into account. With a 35-year background in environmental, agriculture, food, nutritional, and health sciences, this experience spans academic, commercial, and nonprofit sectors. He has a Master of Science and Doctorate from Imperial College London, where he also worked as a postdoctoral research fellow for seven years. He's a fellow of the American College of Nutrition, and you can read more of his article. Um, But what I want to do, when I look at somebody like this, um, I found his, uh, he works with personalized lifestyle medicine Institute. Wow. So then I want to look into them and see what they're about. And he also has a company called metagenics. And then I'm going to look into them. So that's, that's what I w- would do. But um, very interesting. Yeah, Who benefits follow the money. Wow. Yeah. And also, I, can I just interject another a yeah. question? Why is the defender posting a ratio of three to one for uh, Hetfund and Bosch versus my one opposition? First, they they did a whole long article on Hetfund and Bosch's video interview with McMillan, Dr. Mm-hmm. McMillan. A whole they gave a whole transcript of it. Yeah. And then they they when they saw my article about blowing the whistle basically on Hetfund and Bosch, they mm-hmm. contacted me and they reposted my article. And then they followed it with Fair Keck and then this one. And then they followed it with another one. So why are they propagandizing for for Hetfund and Bosch and the Defender and and RF, Robert F Kennedy Jr. are supposed to be so so great? There is something strange going on, and 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 it's yeah. not. It doesn't take a great deal of time to see through some of this, and there, there's money involved. So 
there is something strange going on. It, it caused, yeah. there's lots of questions. Yeah, and he links up to your article when he has a hyperlink for uh, it caused a stir. And on the word stir, there's your article here. And what I found interesting was that it was, it they asked to publish your article and they posted it as a rebuttal. And the defender is said that they want scientific debate, but then you're the only rebuttal, which I think is fair because there's interesting, you know, you, there's information you present that people should take into consideration. But then like you're saying, it was, um, there's, been kind of an exaggerated response to it. And when I when they asked me, would I can they post my article? I said yes. And then I followed up a very short time afterwards saying, well, you should do more than that. You should put a note on the original, your original mm. unquestioning, unqualified uh, support of Khaled Fund and Bosch. You should say, OK, there are some questions about this. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do that. And instead, on my article, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. posted a comment saying, we stand basically by what we said about Chet van den Bosch, and we mm. stand with what Del Bigtree is saying. And Del Bigtree with the high wire is strongly supporting Chet van den Bosch. It was the opposite of saying, we well, you know there are some questions actually. No, they're saying no. We're, and then they followed up with two basically slightly not obvious, but still clearly um, uh, pro Chet van den Bosch articles. So this is not helping to get to the truth. And in, in this is disappointing on the part of very disappointing on the part of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And of course, as many people may or may not know that Bobby Kennedy Jr. appeared on Del Big Tree's show to help to pummel me for, for having raising any questions about Kurt Van den Bosch's work, along yeah. with Andy Wakefield. So there is something disturbing going on. Yeah, and it is interesting. Um, and I, I have to say, if like if people are not sure about that, I would ask you to do a bit of research um, because it. what was interesting is what happened with Rosemary's article. I read it myself first, so I didn't see there was anything offensive in there. That's not how I read it. Um, but then I somebody shared that um, video from Del Big Tree show. So I had a look at it and I was really surprised. I I was surprised at the way it was One presented. One in which uh, Big Tree attacks me and, and he gets yeah. big and Andy Wakefield and Robert Bobby Kennedy Jr. to also attack me. Yeah, and I wanted to see too, like what are they going to present? And I didn't see any evidence presented. I didn't see any good... Um, uh, and, and the way that it was done was really curious to me. So I, I've been doing a lot of research into this to see like what's what's kind of behind this and and the thing is what i try to think of is whether they um if it doesn't a lot of people talk about controlled opposition and i i like to say you know what i it doesn't really matter because the the thing is um you just have to look at what they're saying and are they giving you are they giving you data so you can make your own decision or are they appealing to you emotionally and they're not giving you data and you're kind of being led along? And it could be because they believe in what they're saying and they really are like, that's, you know, this is so important. We can't have a discussion right now. Like we really just have to do this. And, and even in that case, like you want to ask yourself, well, do I want to take the time to question because it is so important? Do I want to take the time to figure it out for myself or do I want to adopt their views and just go along with it? So, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of, I, I have to say I did not enjoy listening to the video. Um, I then also looked at uh, Vernon Coleman's uh, transcript where he also addressed your article. And it is, it does raise a question about why there was he, such he an attack me for six minutes and, and it's six yeah. minutes straight about Rosemary he showed and, and yeah. you can call him the previous week or a few days earlier it showed mm -hmm. like an article a picture of me from 2008 when I was very into the Green Party and <laughs> and it was a terrible picture of me and it, he called me a political activist or it was bizarre mm -hmm. well here's the thing with like when people go into personal attacks I want to say like everybody's got a history everybody did something and they had their own reasons for doing it you can't just like we were talking about rockefeller institute or cold spring harbor laboratory doesn't necessarily mean anything about you if you were if you went to study there if you did work there it's one piece and then i would be like well what was your reason for going there you know because that 
And, and they don't, there's, yeah, as you said, yeah. they, don't, they don't address the science. That would be one thing. They just avoid it. And they, yeah. I think what they're trying to do is they're saying, well, we like the part of Chet van den Bosch's message that he wants to stop the current vaccines. And so we'll accept that even though the rest is rubbish, we're going to really support that part about stopping the vaccines. And we're going to attack anybody who says, wait a second, there are problems with Chet van den Bosch. Mm -hmm. In fact, what he wants to do is bring in a whole other crop of vaccines. So, and his science is terrible. The whole thing with viral resistance and escape is bunk and the bunk, total bunk, saying yeah. that the new variants are very dangerous and going to get more and more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So if you have something that's mostly garbage, but there's one part that you like, do you say, oh, this is good and support it? And, uh, that seems very, very uh, yeah. un un illogical. Yeah, well, that's interesting because before we started the interview, I was talking to you about this with um, uh, a similar thing with the COVID cases. And why would you take an argument that has so many holes in it and use it as your support? And for me, um, that raises a lot of questions because you don't have to use it. You have so much on your side already. Mm -hmm. That's solid. Why would you use something that has so many holes in it? And then what I would look for, what I would ask people to look at is look at what the proposed solutions are. Look at what it's making you think and, and view of the world. And what are the solutions that are in the wings? Because that's going to give you a bigger, a better picture about what's going on. So, yeah. But anyways, Rosemary, thank you. I don't want to take up any more of your time. And good, interesting. Yeah. Good yeah. Analysis. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope people walk away with this and, um, and look at things a bit more critically. And, you know, the thing is, you always want to think for yourself, you know, to like start to take things apart and be like, you know, considerate of the language people are using and whoever it's coming from whether yeah. whether it's somebody you perceive on your side or somebody you like and you see another material of theirs that checks out still always be critical because it's it's a good faculty to keep up because as we see with too many people if you don't use it you lose it and then you can be completely fooled and are completely fooled mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and the thing is like even rosemary myself and other we all make mistakes we're not omniscient so we need these different approaches. We need people who see things from another angle and we have to look at that and practice our own discernment. So thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you, Amy. Great talking yeah. to you again. Take care. <laughs> Bye.